Hey, I'm Derek. And I'm Noah. You're listening to A Bite Of. Where we take our current favorite pop culture obsession and enjoy it one nibble at a time. Ooh, in this case, two kind of medium-sized nibbles. Yeah, Mm -hmm. uh, healthy servings. Yes. Avatar, The Last Airbender, Netflix's live action is finally here for all the world to see. All eight episodes. And we decided to split it. It's it's hard to do these Netflix shows when they're all released, right? We're not going to do it weekly. That's kind of fun. But I think splitting it into two, doing episodes one through four, and then five through eight is a good idea. There's yes. a lot to talk about. There's a lot to talk about. And I also think this helps us a little bit with self-control because we are indeed bingers. And if we can binge the whole thing, we will. Mm-hmm. And people do. Yeah. So we're like, watch four. Take a breath, think about it, and then immediately watch the next four. <laughs> yeah. So by we actually haven't seen five through eight. So we're watching it as we're reviewing it. Mm-hmm. So we've only seen half of this. Lots of thoughts, lots of feelings. Um, I, yeah, I, that's how I feel <laughs> at the moment. As I think many of us do. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So before we get into everything, uh, review, leave a review. If you haven't, throw some stars our way. We always like to see it. We're still on the road to 200. We're getting out there, you know, especially you guys listening to Spotify. You guys are putting those stars in. I love to see it. Uh, Patreon. We have a avatar quiz hangout that is on Patreon where we take the quiz to find out what vendor we would be. And we kind of just talk about it as we do it. It's just a hangout. It's like fun. Grab a drink. Take the quiz with us. It's mm-hmm. a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, our mailbox is open. ABO nibbles at gmail.com. We have an, we got this email that is amazing. For the Avatar, we haven't read the whole thing because it talks about the entire Everything, live action, yeah. but it's amazing. And we're at the end of this. We're going to talk about that email. So we're, we will have mailbag sections. So if you have feelings or thoughts or whatever, just send them abo nipples at gmail.com. Yes. And we did not read the whole thing because we did not want to be spoiled. So we are going to issue now an official spoiler alert. Yes. Don't get those cabbages all rotten. No, we spoiled it for you because look, things are different. In this series. So if you don't want to be spoiled, come back a little later. Mm -hmm. All right. So let us officially take a bite of Avatar The Last Airbender episodes one through four. 12 year old Aang is discovered in an iceberg by Southern Water Tribe siblings Katara and Sokka. They join the Avatar on an adventure to help him discover those who can aid him in becoming a master of all four elements. The Fire Nation's Prince Zuko, along with Uncle Iroh, are on a quest to find the Avatar for Zuko's father, Fire Lord Ozai. While they're hot on his trail, Aang and the gang take to the skies and meet Momo, the Kyoshi Warriors, Teo, Sai, Jet, and an old friend, King Boomy. Mm. That is barely skimming the surface of what <laughs> happens in these four episodes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's dive into this, right? We did a before you watch Netflix's Avatar. We it was more of a celebration of the original series. How do you feel, just briefly, of these first four episodes of this adaptation? I think that there are some strengths, but I also think that there are some weaknesses. And I'm I'm not even in that sense comparing it to the animated Avatar. I'm saying that within this sort of new world that they've created, there are some things that are lacking, honestly, mainly on the production side, mm. not necessarily the story side. I mean, I think there are some struggles there too. <laughs> <laughs> but there are a lot of things within the production that are kind of tripping me up a little bit. But are the characters, our main characters, still charming? Absolutely. Is bending still awesome? Heck yeah. Appa and Momo are there and <laughs> still exist to just enlighten my heart. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I think that, you know, you can't go into the series expecting the animated series. Agreed. You're setting yourself up for failure a hundred percent right out the gate. It's like you have to taper your expectations mm-hmm. when seeing stuff like this. Do I think that the creators of the show love the series and are trying to do the best they can with it? Yes. Mm-hmm. I think it's better than the other adaptation we got, which I do not want to talk about. Yes. It doesn't take six benders to move one boulder. So that's great. But I like it. I think it looks beautiful. I think that the costuming is trying its best to emulate what it does in the animated series. 
the cast is fine. Like, I think there are some interesting moments, but I, it's more on, again, the production side where I'm like, eh, some smoother stuff mm-hmm. could really sell it, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, so going into these episodes, the first episode, first 20 minutes is completely new. Backstory. The story is the same, but we actually see it. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you feel about seeing what happens to the air nomads? So I want to touch on something that you had said about uh, earthbending. So this actually opens up not even with the air nomads. It's just with some earthbender running through the Fire Nation with a scroll of some sort. And it turns out they're battle plans. But in those first moments, I was like, he, I thought, made earthbending look so difficult. (laughs) Like he was like digging his fist into the ground, like just barely getting things up. Whereas, you know, I'm so used to seeing just like giant boulders and slats just like coming out of the ground doing this. Yes, and exactly. Like, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, OK, so they're kind of going in a different direction here. I think later on, earthbending looks a little easier, but this guy in particular made it look really hard. I thought it was really good, though. Like, it I, looked I think good. Yeah. As an opener, it's like, OK, we're going to get some like bending you Mm -hmm. know it looks great like the actual visuals of the bending especially the fire fire looks phenomenal yes in the show i'm i don't know if it's real or not (laughs) um ouch but yeah i agree i think it maybe it's for the live action that they're more interpreting it like you know you're pulling from the earth Mm -hmm. and you have to like like, a giant solid mass yeah Yeah. so like i get it but yeah i agree you know earth does look like it's a little more of a struggle yeah and so in this this scene that's taking place a hundred years before we meet Saka and Katara, we also get to see Sozin mm-hmm. and, and, and it really does show that the apple didn't far, very far fall very far from the tree because, you know, once they capture this earthbender, they just light him up. Right. Right. It, it this. It, so here's what I think mm. <laughs> about this opening. I like the opening. It's like, okay, cool. You know, it's very dark. You immediately know, okay, they're going in a darker turn. And then it gets like really dark mm-hmm. with just the genocide yes. of the air nomads. I it's I feel a certain way about it. Like I like that they didn't show it in the animated series. I don't know if we needed to see it. Like I get that they wanted to connect and show that like this is what happened and Aang wasn't there to help. I don't know if he could have really helped. Maybe Avatar State activates. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think like the climate in the world and then seeing that kind of stuff. It was a little dark. Like yeah. this is based on a kid show, so like I get they wanted to make it more dramatic and appeal to like Game of Thrones fans. But sure. I don't know. I think like constantly incinerating people is like oh, okay like sure <laughs> and it's also this thing of if they can constantly incinerate people <laughs> like they can just do it right do you know what i mean yeah. like why do there's do there need to be these battles why does that need to happen it almost it almost feels like sort of a blood bending thing where mm. if it's something that happens it's taboo and you're not supposed to do it that's not explained i'm just kind of looking into it of like if if firebenders have the power to just light people up couldn't the Fire Nation have just taken over real easily? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's that thing of like, what was the nation that was going to try to take over them all? Of course, it was fire. Mm. Um, I don't want to necessarily, going forward, like really compare it to the original animated series, because that's going to be hard, right? And if we're going to do that, animated series is always going to come out on top. Yeah. But there's like certain things that I think, with it being a kid show, but also purposefully like not having the fire nation incinerate people. I do think it kind of gives those rules and balances Mm -hmm. to how the world works. Yeah. So like seeing it like constantly, because I feel like the firebenders so far in these four episodes really do that quite a bit. It's like, yeah, they're scary, but like you could show it in a different way. Mm. That's like, but I want to say the coolest thing though, about this like scene is seeing all the air nomads. Mm -hmm. Really cool to see them all, how they're, you know, temple looks and how they kind of do their culture was great. You know, Master Gyatso, seeing him, fantastic. Yeah. I think the relationship between Aang and him really shone through. And it's like, I get why they showed it because it gives us that like connection between the two. Yeah, definitely. And I, I, we need that connection because in this part, 
you know, in, in this, I'm going to, I'm going to stop saying like in this particular adaptation <laughs> in this, the death of Gyatsu is something that pushes Aang forward to want to become the best avatar that he can be. I do think this, this earlier scene, although it is very violent, I think it does give us that history in the sense of, well, how did they destroy all the air nomads? You know, if their air nomads couldn't live just, you know, aired like they away. all got together for this festival. Exactly. Right. So all of them from the northern air temple came to the southern one, and that's how they were able to defeat all of them in one go. I'm like, okay, I get that. Makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. It, Terribly, but yeah. yeah. And, and we get to see Sozin in action and sort of see how despicable he was and how evil he was and how that influenced Ozai and where he's coming from. And of course, the comet was coming down, which gave them the power. So yeah, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just stop it right I'm there. gonna leave it there yeah it is an interesting change because I think you know having Aang you know be told that it happened without him s- discovering it at the southern air temple it's like an interesting change right but I think with what the story they're trying to tell it makes sense mm-hmm. for the story they're trying to tell here um fast forward a little bit the first interaction that we see with Katara and Sokka how do you feel about them? How do you feel about these betrayals of these characters? So one of the things that I'm really pleasantly surprised with is their portrayals. And it's actually my my surprise is more in the Sokka lens because I think that we're, we have this character who is, I think, definitely based on the character that we love. Right. Right. So in the beginning, we do see him. He's protective of the tribe and he like that's his role. He's the oldest one there. He takes it very seriously. He's a little hard headed. He's not, you know, leaning into the bending like Katara is. Uh, But we do have that humor there, which is the thing that I love so much about Sokka. So I think that their portrayals are are really great. Right. I, I agree. I think that like. In you know, Katara has these moments where like she's very strong and she knows what she's doing and she's very smart, but then she does have those outbursts like mm-hmm. a kid does, you know, and not really knowing how to navigate her emotions and stuff like that. And I think both of them do it pretty well. You know, I, I know one of the criticisms before it came out was I believe the showrunner or writers had said that like they took out the very misogynistic side of Sokka because they didn't want to show that. I still feel like this is Sokka. Even without that, I think that that's an interesting arc that he goes through mm-hmm. in the original series. I don't think it's really needed because he's just as funny. Mm-hmm. Um, could be a little funnier, <laughs> just saying. But it does seem like because this series is a little more dramatic, that some of those childish moments or goofy moments aren't as prevalent. Right? They're not. They're not going penguin sledding. Ugh. You know, they're not doing those types of things right. in this. What did you think of the actual tribe and of Grand Grand and sort of the bigger picture of the Southern Water Tribe? Great. I think there's more people than it depicted in the show. There were like 10 in the show. I know. (laughs) Um, They were mostly children and Grand Grand. I think it was great. I think that what this show so far in these four episodes that I'm seeing is really distinguishing each nation, each tribe, each people how they're supposed to be right it's mm-hmm. like you have the air nomads you have the the tribes of the water and you have the earth kingdom which looks very more opulent and then you have the fire nation which is very crude and metal and like straight lines and stuff like that so i think they did a good job of showing that and also it's really nice to see people of color playing people of color absolutely you know so that's a huge plus mm-hmm. the scene where they show like earth water air and like the intro that we're so used to great amazing i wish it was the intro every time for the show you know like yeah i'm not trying to be negative so far with this but it's like her saying it i liked because that's how stories are told in tribes like this right Mm. it's like this is the story of you ang disappearing and it just happens to be the intro right and i believe that that intro is the constant reminder of why Katara is there because I believe that Aang can save the world because she's been told this story yes yeah and and for Katara it's while she wants to master waterbending I don't believe that is the true reason or or the main driving force of why she's doing this she's doing this because she wants to support the avatar because she knows that he can bring peace yeah 
And yeah. so that that is that sort of reminder. Yeah. And, you know, whenever she's um, persuading Sokka to go after him and all of this stuff, that's very at the forefront, right? She's mm-hmm. like, because this is the right thing to do. Like he is supposed to bring balance to the world. Like we're all terrified of the Fire Nation. I can't bend because they hunt us down. He's supposed to help that. Like, mm-hmm. are, is that not what we're supposed to do here? So I like that of the characterization of her. Um, I think that's really good. The Iroh and Zuko so far in these four episodes are really my favorite. Mm. I think their relationship is portrayed really well. That would have been a make or break for me, right? It's like if they didn't get it right, it would have felt so flat because they have just as much screen time and importance to the story. Yeah. Yeah. I think they did a fantastic job. They're not really prevalent in like the first episode so much as they are in the next couple episodes, but look amazing. Firebending's awesome. Yeah. I definitely think that Dallas Lou is giving full on teen angst, you know, <laughs> moody, sassy Zuko, sassy Zuko yeah. for sure. I think he's a little hot headed and, you know, he always, it, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of like if, if Zuko had an angel and a devil, the angel is Uncle Iroh and the devil is his father, mm. is Ozai. Or right. Even his inner voice. Right. And so, but the the beauty is, is that his angel is in real life, always next to him, kind of telling him to calm down and it'll right. be okay. Let's have some tea. You know, let's really think about this. And so I agree that that relationship really has to work in order for Zuko's arc to take place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Paul Song Hang Yuli. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. So good. We know him from many other properties, but he he brings such he's seasoned actor, right? So it's mm-hmm. very apparent he knows what he's doing and he can cry on cue, um, look intimidating, and also deliver lines like nobody else. Very happy with mm-hmm. his portrayal. Part of me is almost like, what if they just like did their show and like <laughs> <laughs> just like, you know, just like an offshoot of it? I would I would love it so much. But yeah, I, I think the first episode did a good job of explaining a lot. It's very exposition heavy, mm-hmm. but I think that's to be expected. We need that. Because it's a whole new world, exactly. right? And so, yes, some of the other episodes do build on that, but it's not as heavy. Yeah. At least in these other three episodes that we watched. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the practical makeup okay. in this show, especially with our boy Zuko here. Mm. Personally, I think they could have gone farther with the scar. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it, it's not like a big deal breaker for me personally, but it is one of those things where it's like you could have, you know, like prosthetic or something like that, or made it bigger going on the side. It, it makes the fact that I mean, spoiler that his father did it to him even m- more of a betrayal seeing the damage that was done and he can't hide it and he can't hide it. Right. Whereas this to me looks like just put some makeup. on. Yeah. He just has like a rash on (laughs) his eye, right? Right. His eyebrow was really still there. There's two little pieces. His ear is still perfectly fine. You know, that was such a thing. That was a constant reminder to Zuko of what his father did to him. And although there is a reminder there, it doesn't seem as drastic. The one thing appearance aside with Zuko specifically in these four episodes, like one of the things, and I guess like an icon- iconic thing for Zuko um, throughout the series is him talking about getting his honor back. Mm. And so far in these four episodes, I don't even think I've heard him say that, you know, it's more like I, it's more like I want to please my father type of thing or go back home. Mm. Um, so that was really the only characterization of him where I'm like, he hasn't really talked about honor. Like that's a big thing for Zuko because once he finally gets that honor, it's not the honor he was seeking in the first place. Yeah. So I think it's interesting the way they're playing that angle. Yeah. So far. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, but moving on to episode two now, this is when our crew is together and they're flying away, right? Uh, our, our beautiful air bison, Appa, is just doing his thing, you know, flapping that big old tail in the wind. And they decide he, Ang wants to go home. So he wants to go to the Southern Air Temple, and this is where he discovers what happened there. This episode out of the four are my favorite. Really? Yeah, me too. Me yeah. too. Me too. What do you mean, really? I was like, wait, <laughs> no, but I forgot. This leads into the Warriors, so yes. you're right. Kyoshi Warriors are in this episode. They look fantastic. More on them in a second. More about Aang's avatar state and when he finally sees what happened to mm-hmm. his people, and it mm-hmm. really hits him. And then this is the point for him where he has to either feed into that or 
do something better that he's supposed to do. Right. Avatar State looks great. I think that like the way they're interpreting um, airbending is really cool because it's very like gale force winds and like, you know, twisters and funnels and stuff like that. I think it's really cool. The part where he like sees Gatso dead in his skeleton and then he like goes up in that famous scene where he's just like losing it looks so cool. The visuals in this show, 95% of the time are so good. I agree. So good. Even like, I know most of it's a green screen, so like you can kind of tell, but like it looks appealing and it looks nice. And the visual effects with the bending is just yeah, chef's kiss. One of the set pieces that I really appreciated was actually sort of what I'm calling like the Southern Water Tribe's town hall, mm-hmm. which you could tell they use like whale bones right. to make, you know, the architecture of of this place. And I thought that was such a beautiful element there. So I think, like you're saying, so much of this looks amazing. The ships look incredible. These worlds that they're designing. And even the air temple, which has now been, you know, taken over by nature, uh, still looks beautiful, even though it's broken down underneath. Yeah, I do wish there was more practical Mm. because that hall that you're talking about that's in the Southern Water Tribe just looks so cool and it looks real, right? It looks tangible. I wish there was a little more uh, practical. It's not a hit or miss for me. Mm. You know, it's just like, oh, seeing that and then seeing like, this is clearly CGI, like it looks great. But I wish there was like a little more practical. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this and thinking about some of the makeup work in the series. And I almost feel like high definition is going to be the death of practical. (laughs) Because (laughs) like, you know, with some of the old age makeup, you can kind of tell that it's a prosthetic. And, you know, with even something like Appa, right? We've watched interviews and things like Appa is like a torso, I think, and maybe a piece of a head, and then they're CGIing everything else in it. And so it feels like they're leaning away from doing puppetry and practical because of what it will look like in high definition. Well, you kind of have to. Yeah. Well, I mean, with stuff like this, there's just no way. I mean, you, you with something like this, that's just so imagination heavy and like unrealistic to really do that. It's like how much they do is really going to be the make or break for it. I think from the amount of money that they put in the visual effects looks great. Mm. So like no complaints there. I think that they had to do that. They knew they needed to correct some mistakes and separate themselves to like, at least be, be better Mm -hmm. and do a good job at it. And I think in that department, they did. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Speaking of makeup though, Kyushu warriors. Ah. So good. Stuntina. They look amazing. I love the added character of Suki's mom. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. I think that was a good dynamic. And we kind of get more of Suki and Herb's relationship. Them kind of be- being like no outsiders was jarring a little bit. Mm-hmm. I know they, they kind of did that in the animated, but like it felt very like no, which is funny because like their whole point is to embody the teachings of Avatar Kyoshi and her being an orphan. And stuff like that and wanting to help people. It's kind of like, wow, time really kind of made you guys like, especially with the Fire Nation, like this is what it's doing to people. Exactly. I was just going to say that it's showing the effects of this war and how these these communities are coming becoming more and more insular because they need to protect themselves from the violence and the carnage that's going on outside. And it's like, if we can be a little moon shaped island community that can <laughs> stay to itself, well, then we're going to do that. Yeah. You know, I. I I, I like the juxtaposition between sort of the old way and the new way between Suki and her mother, because Suki is going like, what are we doing here? If we're not going to help the avatar, we literally have a giant statue of our avatar. Right. You know, why would we not help the new one? And so uh, I'm glad that she kind of makes her mother see what they should really be doing. Yeah. And it's one of those things of like, you know, it's like the little mermaid thing, like, I want to be a part of the world. Like I haven't seen the world. So how am I supposed to know what you're saying? Like, how am I supposed to react to this stuff? Like they seem fine. And she's like, look, if the outsiders are adorable, like this guy, what are we doing? How did you feel about them kind of like advancing Sokka and Suki's relationship that quickly? I kind of loved it. I thought it was well done. Uh huh. You know, at first I was like, this doesn't happen yet. What about (laughs) Yue? 
he's about to meet Yue and he's just going to be like, oh, I just kissed the most beautiful girl ever. And then I have googly eyes for Yue. How dare you? But I liked it. I thought it was very well done. The acting, fantastic. But like the moment where she's teaching him how to be a warrior, um, it was just so intimate and it was sweet. And I liked it. Yeah. There, there was a lot of uh, people peeking through doors, right? <laughs> he sees her practicing when she's leading the Kyoshi Warriors. And then they're doing their little like love battle dance. And her mother's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> they're falling in love. Yeah. I mean, I thought I, I thought it would have been too soon if they kissed in that scene mm. when they were kind of doing their battle thing. Because it was kind of like the meet cute Suki peeking through a door where he's washing his face. Right. And he's like, oh, we get that little silly yeah. moment of him covering himself up. Then there's like their first date, which is <laughs> battling which the is, Fire Nation. Yeah. And then, you know, the kiss comes. Yeah. So I think I think the the plotting and doing it within a 45 minute episode worked for me. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Um, I really liked it. I think Avatar Kiyoshi, everything about her, fantastic. Um, I liked the interpretation of the spirit world and what it looked like. It looks a little dreamy and stuff like that, mm. which is come to be expected. I like that, you know, just like when Avatar Roku takes over Aang and you see him physically and, you know, that was a, a Fire Nation temple, um, but they did it this time yes. with Kyoshi. Great. I loved seeing it in action. I'm so happy that we rewatched book one before <laughs> this because I think I wouldn't have remembered that Roku sort of Aang became Roku in that fire temple. And I would have been questioning, like, why is this happening? But... <laughs> It is obviously a thing that can happen, right? right? Where right. Kyoshi or Aang becomes Kyoshi or Kyoshi becomes Aang, whatever it is, um, and just kind of, you know, kicks ass for lack of a better term. <laughs> we get Commander Zhao in this one. In this episode, I believe that's when he's introduced in episode two. Um, I, I thought he was fine. He's not like scaring me or anything, but I think him seeing being opportunistic Mm. With like, oh, I could be the one to like get the avatar and like sneaking letters to, you know, the Fire Nation and stuff like that. I think it was good. But him coming up to the Kyoshi Warriors thinking that he's going to do something. Stupid. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, watch this sucker. Fans just being able to deflect the fire bending. It's just really cool. That whole action set piece was awesome to yeah. see. They really did a good job with the choreography, with the bending and the fighting of non-benders. Um, and seeing Sokka and Suki be able to fight so well together just adds more to like, you guys are meant to be. The love story. Yeah. And I, I think for Sokka, this is something that he needs to see because as we know, a struggle for Sokka is not being able to bend, right? He's just the other guy in his own words. Uh, so watching him see these amazingly fierce warriors not rely on bending, but just be themselves mm -hmm. i think is important to him as a fighter and yeah, a warrior i agree and for somebody to like suki who he knows is a great warrior and her line that she says you know we can't bend but we have to be better than the benders mm -hmm. because we can't bend is just an amazing line yeah. and i think really speaks to that character like she understands her place in the world and she's like i need to be better than that and she is yeah Suki. and i think her mom also as well that was really cool to see it wasn't this thing of suki see what you've done because they're here they're here she's like no people are invading i'm going to fight too right, right. you know and i loved seeing her step up to the plate she took that stance and we thought oh she might have been a kyoshi warrior herself back uh -huh. in the day well she definitely knows the move she right? can't not she gave her daughter that look and she was like we're going to like fuck these people up. Let's fucking do this, baby. <laughs> I'm going to beat the shit out of these people. Yeah. <laughs> but this was out of the four again. This is my favorite episode because I think it's very strong. Mm. Um, lots of action. Lots of movement of the characters. Katara is really coming into her bending. And I think uh, we got our wish of the pirate storyline being X'd out because we see that she gets the water scroll to teach her bending from Grand Grand and not stolen from the ship. Yeah. I mean, I think... When you condense 20 episodes into eight, even though these are an hour long, each one of those was like 20-ish minutes, you have to find ways to meld storylines together to propel that story. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine like being the person that decides like, okay, we're going to like cut all of this yeah. stuff out, but we're going to put this person in its place. Yeah. I think generally the structure of it is good. 
Um, but like, it's one of those things where it's like, I know the original story. So like sometimes when they put it together, I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. But it does keep you on your toes. Right. And that's one of the fun things about adaptations is that like, you don't know what's going to yeah. happen. You're like, wait, this character shouldn't be here. What's happening. So something else that they do in this, which they sort of switch up is that Kyoshi tells Aang in the spirit world that they have to get to the Northern water tribe because the fire nation is going to basically, you know, blast it to pieces. Yeah. She's like, are you going to let what happened to your people happen to the water tribe as well? So she really like pushes them that way. It's funny. <laughs> she, She's very strong-willed. I mean, there's no mincing words with Kiyoshi in no. this conversation with Aang. And, um, you know, <laughs> I feel like although Aang technically is 112 years old, he's only 12. Yeah, he's, he's a baby. Yeah. yeah. And, and he's not even supposed to know he's the Avatar, right? They usually wait till you're 16. It's yeah. like, give the kid a break. Yeah. And, you know, I think they did a relatively good job of, like, showing him that, like, even though you didn't mean to disappear... This is what happened because you did. I do think Kiyoshi was a little hard on him because it's like she should know that, like, you didn't mean to. Yeah. Like, he just, sorry, I was scared. Um, but I think he needed some type of firm hand. And the funny thing is, it's, it's himself. Right. That's telling him that. But the, having that kind of be the point of the first season, which it seems like getting to the Northern Water Tribe to prevent this tragedy from happening... I think is an interesting way to do like the point so far. I, again, in these next couple episodes that we haven't seen yet, maybe they do mention like you have to be good at this time or else the world will fall apart right. with the comet. But right now we just know that he has to get there. So far in these four episodes, though, one glaring thing that I think is interesting is that like he's not learning any other bending so far, like even with Katara there, like kind of one of the points of this so again i will take this back if in the next four episodes he does but so far it is interesting that like he's not really learning yeah. anything he's just learning that everybody hates him there was this <laughs> there was this moment that i thought was funny where they could have had an opportunity to have katara teach him something she's practicing by the river with the water scroll and he comes over to her and he's like oh you're doing pretty good blah 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 he kind of teaches her about movement and about grabbing onto the water. And then they're like, ha ha, let's go play in the water. And I thought, oh, they'll bend at each other. But instead, they both walk over to the water and like crouch and start splashing each other. I'm like, but these are two people that can bend Whoa. water. Yeah. I mean, I think like in that scene, they could have. I don't like the splashing thing was fine to me because it's like they're kids. You know what I mean? So it was cute. Yeah. But like him kind of being the spiritual teacher to her of like, it's not just all about like using powers. Like you have to find balance and use the world, um, which is smart for him. Right. So mm -hmm. he's kind of teaching Katara in that way. Um, I wish for the water side again, later, she has to be the one to teach him. But right now it's interesting that he's just kind of like, no, I'm okay. I don't want to learn anything else. Like he's almost like really further back than accepting yeah, that it, he's the avatar. And I also feel like in there's so much guilt that he's dealing with it. It seems to be stopping him from discovering those things. Yeah. yeah. You know, and being a little lighter. Yeah. We do see him do the little air ball thing into the statue, which was a nice nod to the opening in the animated uh, feature, but that's, that's really about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so moving on to kind of the next two episodes, cause it's almost a two parter um, in a way. It's just kind of continues this. This is Omashu and into the dark. So I was very excited to see this because, again, yay, Earth Nation. I'm very Earth Kingdom. I love them so much. So anything with them. This was really interesting. I didn't really care for the main part of it. I mm. thought it was, eh. But I liked, I think there's very strong moments throughout the whole thing. Yeah, I'll say that they lost me with episode four. I'll be completely honest, where I was kind of like, what's happening? And I thought to one of the things that you said in our before you watch episode where you were really excited about them going to the Northern Air Temple. And that's where they actually meet Teo yeah. and his father. Yeah. And so they've now condensed them to living in the in Omashu. Yeah. So the, they mix a few of them. They mix Boomi's story, um, Jet and the Freedom Fighters and the Northern Air Temple, Teo and his father. Um, they kind of put them all together, which I'm fine with. Mm -hmm. I think that like. 
like looking at it from a bigger lens, it's like, this makes sense for the story. Like they should kind of put these together. Um, I really liked Teo and his dad. I think they were great. They changed kind of how these characters are, but the through line of still making his father build these things for the fire nation Mm -hmm. to protect them, I think is something that I'm glad they didn't change. I like Teo's attitude in this one a little more. Yeah. Like he's not so much like a pacifist or like, Oh, everything's fine. And this one, he's very much like, dad, you suck. Yeah. You're a bitch. What have you been doing? You (laughs) turd. Yeah. How dare you? Um, if you listen to the before you watch episode, I admit it, I'm not a fan of Jet. I thought it was fine, but like I wasn't sold at Jet in the original series. So like I wasn't, I don't care. <laughs> Fair. Yeah, you know, I I do have to say I did find Sebastian Amoroso, who plays Jet, quite charming. He was very charming. Like he's the one yeah. that originally gets them in Omashu. Mm-hmm. And right from the beginning, I was like, okay, he's selling something. What's this right. guy doing here? And then to see who he is because he is he's a very charismatic leader and i think that the actor definitely portrayed that in this character and you can see why katar was sort of you know swooned by him a little bit right right this um i believe the third episode is also the episode we get introduced to azula Mm. really for the first time Mm -hmm. so we're getting her early in this book um in the season i thought her intro was strong like it just shows her like Willing to do anything, sadistic side, rooting out rebels and everything. Um, when she poses as that rebel to get them in there to set him up, and then, and then her set him on fire, her dad setting him on yeah. fire, and she's just like toasty. Yeah. Oh yeah, love it. Um, fine. I I think the introduction is interesting, and we're getting we're getting to see a little bit before we see her in like season two. She in the animated series, she was kind of a cliffhanger. Yeah. For the end of season one, right? We're like, wait, who is this? And here she is. I, I think they're giving us more backstory and showing us how different she is than Zuko, right? Even though it's not mentioned here, Zuko is about honor. I feel like she's about power. Well, she's like the chosen one. She's the golden one, right? Mm-hmm. She's the prodigy, which she shows in her power. It's just, she's like not a good person. No, she's not. All. And that's the thing. So it's like, we saw, we saw how, you know, She's like Ozai. Ozai's like Sozin. So it's like that line is still continuing, this sort of viciousness of these people. And it seems that maybe Zuko and his mother, who we haven't heard about yet, were the other side of that. Right, right. And, you know, Zuko really more aligns with his mother. And unfortunately, she's not here, um, Mm -hmm. which I can think you can. I'm not too sure how much they show it in the next four episodes, but it is a good it's a good way to portray these two characters of like Azula kind of be more like the dad and Zuko being a little more like the mom. Um, I love seeing May and Ty Lee. Yes. I think characterization, we saw two seconds of them and I'm like, May, May gets it. They were the two, they were perfect. The <laughs> yeah. two of them. I mean, I, uh, I can't wait to see Ty Lee, you know, walk on her hands and hitting people's pressure points. Oh my God. Oh gosh. So good. But we're, I, that's the question though, is that like looking at this new, at, at this live action, wh- how soon are they, the three of them going to go out into the world? Right. That's what we don't know yet. No, not yet. We still have four more episodes yeah. to see. Um, so far, I'm fine with it. I think that, you know, Azula, the, the motivations of like Azula and Zuko, I really want to finish the series to be like, this worked for me mm. or this didn't work for me. Um, as long as Azula gets to the point where she's supposed to be, I think it's fine, right? I think so far what we've seen, the general like arc or purpose of those characters seems to be going that way. One of the big things that happens in this episode is that Iroh and Aang, you know, they they get captured at some point in these two episodes and they actually get to have interactions together without anybody else there. This is wild. Um, Which is great. I thought it was an interesting person for Aang to get advice from. So it's Iroh. Like, I don't think he really discriminates against who he needs to help, Mm -hmm. especially in like a spiritual way or a way of thinking. Um, So I really appreciated the scene of those two together because Aang is still very much acting like a kid and Iroh is like talking to him like, well, this is kind of like, this is how it works. Yeah. And, but we, in this scene, we, we start to see a little bit of Iroh's backstory and his relationship with Zuko. Aang says something to him along the lines of, oh, so I guess Zuko is just like his father and he's willing to do anything to get what he wants or to capture me. 
And Iroh's like, n- not exactly. Right. That Iroh knows him. Right. right. And, and, and then on top of that, you know, he says, Iroh says something like, you know, they're willing to do whatever it takes, no matter who they lose. And again, he's in here. We, we have the first inkling of him talking about his son that he lost. Yeah. Yeah. In the battle of Ba Sing Se. Yeah. I thought it was an interesting choice to really talk about his son so early, but I thought it was really well done because it makes you care for Zuko and Iroh's relationship. Right. A little more. You see that at the funeral for his son, how people are like talking shit to him at the funeral for his son. And Zuko at first is just very like respectful. He's like, I'm so sorry. And then he's like, let me like actually tell you how I feel. Very sweet scene. You can hear in the background the tune of Leaves from the Vine, which is from Tales from Balsi Say, the um, episode in season two. I hope we still get that scene if there is a season two, but I thought it was a good way to strengthen that relationship. It, it really shows you that, you know, Zuko becomes Iroh's son and Iroh becomes Zuko's father. Right. Right. It's the thing that they don't have and the support that they need. And at the base of it is friendship and love. The the whole scene where Zuko is like, you see it's after the Agni Kai with his father and he has the patch on his eye and he's boarding his ship ready to be banished. And Iroh comes and he's like, why do you want to be here? He's like, everything I need is on this ship. He's like, you, do you need a friend at least? You know, um, great. That, that part got me a little teary. I was just People like, let me <laughs> tell you about my best friend. It was just like that scene. So good. Mm-hmm. Like, I love that part of their relationship. You know, in thinking about Iroh's character, the restraint that Iroh has to have to not fully just take Zuko and point him in the direction that he really should be going, he's very patient. He watches Zuko make these decisions that he knows sometimes won't work out, but he knows that he has to let Zuko find his way. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that the person portraying this character, you know, they need to know that. And I think he does a good job of that. Yeah, I agree. It's one of those things where it's like they have to come to it themselves Mm -hmm. because then it won't be genuine. And I like that they're still going with that arc. Speaking of these two, because there's so much in these two episodes with them. I loved when they finally went to the market and you have Uncle Iroh just like being excited about all the food and everything. And Zuko's just like, I need to find the kids and I need to find them. And he's like, just kind of like stop and smell the roses enjoy for a second. the market yeah. i mean when have you ever been to omashu we need to experience these things one of the greatest things happens in this uh part because ang and zuko fight and they're kind of running through the market seeing zuko get smacked by with a brush from a lady <laughs> was just so funny to me i love it because like that's when they get the themes and like the the tone correct because you have this amazing fight scene going on and there's so much happening and you're like do they really want to hurt each other? What's happening? And then you have a funny moment of just Zuko getting beat with a brush. Like, yeah, yeah, definitely. And I thought that this scene was a lot of fun. I thought the choreography was really good. And again, we sort of see the see the relationship between Iroh and Zuko of Iroh saying, Zuko, go. Yeah, he sacrifices himself. He sacrifices himself. Yeah, it's sure. very good. So let's go to Boomy because we haven't really talked about it. Let's don't go make, to Boomy. Don't make that face. <laughs> um, I, give me your thoughts. What do you think about the Boomy storyline? I thought my face said it all. No, I think that. So, how do you play like a hundred and fifteen year old king who's just like a Looney Tunes, right? right. Yeah. So the thing is, is that it feels like Boomy. I I believe has always been a, a a kook. Right. Right. In this portrayal, I don't necessarily see that. Yeah. It I, feels like he was a very serious, not a very, but he was a, a serious kid. And then somewhere along the lines through having to rule through this war, he's kind of lost it. Yeah. I I, I feel like Boomy was known for just being bonkers in a funny way, whereas this felt bonkers in a scary way. Yeah, he... I think so in the email. I love his hat though. Yeah. In the email that we got um, from a wonderful listener, it's very detailed. And I just want to like kind of echo what they said mm. um, with this. It's that Boomy feels very cynical. Mm. And it like, it, it's an interesting move to do because again, everybody hates Aang. And like, 
everybody keeps saying it to him. Like, it's like everybody he's meeting, like his friend that you would think that like would just want to have fun. And like the challenges don't really mean anything. And he's just being his goofy self. And like at the end, they're friends again. And to have him almost be mad at Aang for accidentally leaving and then having to like show him, this is what happened. You want to save the world? Well, this is what I had to do in this one city. Can you do that? I get it. But it was a weird character for them to have do it. Yeah, I think he was too, he was like not fun. (laughs) No. And something you said earlier where like Aang feels further back. I feel like Aang, as we know him, he's done all the philosophical work Hmm. already, right? And so when he would come to these places, I feel like people would be like, oh, in awe that the Avatar is here. And now, and, and would be comforting and be willing to teach him. And now it feels like everybody's like, Oh, great. <laughs> Aang's here. Mm. Oh, you're back. Nice. <laughs> Thanks for nothing. Yeah, I, it, was, it was odd. Like, I feel like he didn't really need to be that cynical and like that like mad at Aang for or also wanting to die. Um, I thought it was just like a too much of a step to remove. Like that was one of the changes where I'm like, didn't work for me. Yeah. Because um, I liked Boomy in the show. Also his like pits. Oh, so much hair. We got him. I mean, that's straight from the show. <laughs> yeah. I, it's almost like they're adding more depth to these characters, but maybe sometimes I don't need the depth. Well, I, there was plenty of depth. It's just like the wrong. Yeah. Wrong end of the pool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but we still got the moments of like, you know, the, the creeping crystal is just like rock candy. We mm-hmm. got that. He put him through those challenges, probably not for the right reasons. Um, but in the end, I think they both came out better, which they got to the end point that they did what they're supposed to. It was just a weird journey to get there. Speaking of journeys, one of my favorite parts of this episode. Sing it. Secret tunnel. (laughs) Do lovers. Okay. Um, (laughs) it's been stuck in my head. Everybody. Noah just sang on the podcast. It happened. (laughs) <laughs> Only for this. You're welcome. It was awful. I'm sorry. I'm going to put auto-tune on that. Ooh. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm not going to do that. Oh, no. Fancy. Um, I really enjoyed this part. It was interesting to see Secret Tunnel be introduced. But you know what? Having Oma and Shu be queer lovers. Lesbians. Amazing. It was um, fantastic. I'm glad that we got introduced to queer characters before Korra. Um, so that's great. Yay for that. Beautifully done. I yeah. loved the you know, images on the wall moving to tell the story and also like this hippie dude telling it. It's fantastic. Yeah. You know, I actually couldn't believe it. Noah was going, it's two women. It's two women. I'm Immediately. Going, I was just like, is that two women? I was like, no, no, <laughs> it can't be. No. And then it was like, she died. And then she, I was like, she and she, she and she. <laughs> that was very exciting. It's amazing. And I, again, it like, those are the story changes or the expansion on the lore that I really appreciate. Also getting secret tunnel. Yes. Like those are the moments where we're like, it's such like an iconic thing from the series where I'm glad you did it. Mm -hmm. Same thing with cabbage guy. Loved it. I love hearing my cabbages and him constantly getting his cart destroyed or set him fire. And, and they made us hang on for that cabbages he didn't say it he at did, first like the first two times he didn't say it and then finally on the third one he said cabbages and we were like rejoice yeah he is here yeah <laughs> having um Sokka and Katara be the ones that have to go through the tunnel instead of Aang and Katara um I thought was good for their character development and their relationship um because it really in this episode Sokka and Katara which does happen in the original series they're like on different ends of like an argument or something mm. or like this group of people believes this thing in this group and they go the separate ways because they believe it. Oh, the divide, the great divide, the great divide. And in this time, you know, she believes in jet at the time and he believes that like size, not, you know, bad come to find out. They're kind of both like not great at what they're doing, Mm -hmm. but it was good for their characters to come to an understanding. Also seeing badger moles. Fantastic. Very scary. Yeah. Very scary. But they see with love. (laughs) Love, love, love. They see with it. It's so nice. I love badger moles. Yeah, so basically good. the badger moles are like, if you come into my house and you're being a bitch, I'm going to be a bitch. You guys have to hold hands. <laughs> yeah, it's like Bad Girls Club. It's like, if you come in swinging, I'm going to swing. It's like, if you're going to be nice, I'm going to be nice. Yeah. 
<laughs> and I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> don't bring don't bring your dark energy into my tunnels. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Into my dark tunnels. Mm-hmm. It's brighter when there's love. Love is brighter in the darkness. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love Katara being like, oh yeah. And we get a nice, a, a really cute little moment here where they're holding hands and that moment of Sokka going like, are we dead? Yeah. And it's like, no, oh, it's love. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, See, and those are the Sokka moments where I'm like, that feels so much like Sokka. Yeah. Kind of back to like the thing that I think was interesting so far in these four episodes in this adaptation. We kind of said in the beginning, like on the production side, I think, you know, we're reviewers, right? We have to look at this from a critical eye at some point. I really much am enjoying this. Mm -hmm. The dialogue is interesting for me. I think that like, some of these characters can deliver a line like the earthbender that was talking to Iroh and was like, you can feel how upset he was of what Iroh did to bossing say amazing. That whole scene I really, really, really enjoyed. And then there's like sometimes where it's like, is that like the only words they could have said in this thing? Like, it's almost like I'm mad and they have to say they're mad to be mad. It's very, it's interesting. Like, I feel like it needs to be strengthened and tightened. Everything, not everything, there are a lot of things that are said that feel like catchphrases. Not, no, not catchphrases, just base level like writing in the sense of like that same character who was talking to Iroh later on when Iroh's free, he walks up to him and the character looks at him and goes, do it, <laughs> just do it. Like that, that's a stock line, right? When Aang is in the Southern Air Temple and they're about to leave, he goes, wait, I have something to do first. Well, yeah. You know what I mean? They're just like these stock lines that don't have much, I don't know, eloquence to them. Right. It's, I think it's like, was that the only thing they could have said? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I don't think it's awful. And again, these are kids doing this, like actual kids acting. I think they do a great job and they're acting like kids, Mm -hmm. which I really enjoy to see. It's just sometimes the words that they're having them say, it's like, uh, yeah, I don't think it's the portrayal of the words. I think it's the words, it's the writing. Right. And it's interesting because it's like, there are scenes where it's like writing Mm -hmm. so tight, Mm -hmm. so good. And then sometimes I'm like, "Mm, okay, well, fine. (laughs) Like, okay. Yeah. (laughs) That's what you could have said. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But that really is my biggest critique so far with this. Like the changes I'm fine with them. Like, I expect these changes. Some of them are working. Some of them like, okay, like you had to mesh these together. Yeah. But writing, I'll, I'll yeah. see if it gets better in these next four episodes. The thing that I'm hoping is if it gets a second season, like I'll watch a second season so far, 100%. I hope that they're like seeing some of these things of like, okay, we could tighten this up a little bit or like maybe let's not do this and let's do this, right? That's kind of the beauty of getting a second try at something. Mm-hmm. Or continue it, but that's like, that's my biggest critique. Yeah, I so agree. Because I think, so it's like when we're saying writing, we mean the dialogue, right. right? So the writing of the changes that they're making, the thing that is, is that they're not changing the arc of the story. They're just finding ways to take other elements and bring them into a different space. It's like almost a different way of getting to that. Exactly. Right. And so we're still getting those things that we love. They're just in a, they're happening at a different time in the story. So that part of the writing is fine. It's the, di- I agree. The dialogue for me is, is rough. Yeah. Is there, so one of the things that we talked about in the before you watch episode was like, if you suck the life out of the thing, you've already failed. Mm. Do you think so far in these four episodes that they have sucked the life out of the adaptation or? No, I don't think so. I think that they could do, I think they could do better service to the life Mm. in ways. I don't think they've completely sucked the life out of it. Derek said it's on life support. Exactly. No, (laughs) don't pull the cord. No, no, no. There's still a heartbeat. There's still a heartbeat. We haven't gone code blue, but one of the main things is like, so I got my sock of humor, right? Mm. But part of what I'm missing is loves Ang for the world and the world loving Ang. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, yeah, that is such Ang is joy, right? He does need more people that are like encouraging him mm-hmm. and not like yelling at him or being mad because like, in the arc of the story, right in the first season, Ang is joy. He is right. love. He is joy. He is hope. Then he goes through something right where he realized what he might have to do. Does he kill people? Does he not? 
And we see that arc. And that's what makes that arc so magical is that we see him being so high. And then we come down, we're like, oh my gosh, this is so hard to see our lovable avatar feeling this way. Whereas now we're kind of just like muddling along with Aang. When will he be so happy that having that turn will be more effective? Yeah, I think there are moments where it shows it like he could be, you know, like I think with Boomy at the final thing, he's like, is it so wrong to be a kid? You know, it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, you, no, you're right. Right. It, like that, that's Aang. Um, but then there's a, there's a lot of moments where you don't really get to see it. I think like him with the small team of Team Avatar, like when they're up on Appa, like you get moments where you can kind of see it. But like when he's in front of a lot of people, you don't get to see it too much. And I think that like that's an important part for the character because I think on um, Kyoshi Island, they get to see it. They get to see him being with kids and seeing how much he can connect with people. And it's like, oh, he is the Avatar. Mm -hmm. He's going to be able to bring these characters together. But if you're like in the Earth Kingdom and everybody hates, hates him, you, yeah, right? <laughs> it's like, mm. well, then I'm not going to save you anyway. <laughs> right. Bye. And again, they get to that point, but it is funny to see them all be like, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Why are you here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> get out. You and an iceberg. We hate you. Yeah. <laughs> Very weird. But I think that that turn that you pointed out of taking a more serious approach to it you know, it's it's landing in that area. It's going to change yeah. some things. Before we wrap this up, I wanted to do our little mailbag session. Mailbag! I do want to say that this person wrote an amazing email, very thorough, which we really appreciate. I want to read the beginning of it because it like threw me back. So they said, before I dive in, I just wanted to take a quick minute to say, I'm always happy to see new episode pop up, up on my podcast feed. I actually listened to the Phantom Zone back in the day. So parasocially, Noah and I go way back. That was like the first podcast I ever did. And it's insane to me that somebody has like followed. It's very nice. It's very like humbling. But it was like to see that name. I was just like, oh, my God, it's been years. That was from my comic book days, which I still talk about. But like, thank you for always being there. I wanted to echo. So again, I didn't really read when I started seeing stuff for the next four episodes. I was like, no. One of the things. So we're talking about everybody hitting Aang. And I just wanted to read the part that they they wrote here about Aang specifically. I actually think in these next four episodes, I'll pull some stuff from here. So you'll get more, more airtime. So they said, everyone's so mad at Aang. Their feelings are valid at all, especially for the regular people. But Aang's first meeting with Kyoshi was rough. I don't know how the incarnation or reincarnation slash spiritual connection thing works, but it's pretty clear that Aang didn't disappear for as long as he did on purpose. Mm. Kyoshi is the embodiment of firm but fair. And I didn't really get that from her in the spirit world. Love her in action, though. I agree. Like, I do feel like the cool thing about this adaptation is they're pulling from those YA books that Mm -hmm. they wrote on Kiyoshi. And we got to learn a little bit more about her. And those are directly from that book. I do feel like she was very harsh on him. So it, it was interesting to have, like, everybody kind of be mean to him and then himself be mean to him <laughs> yeah exactly so i agree with yeah that. yeah definitely it, it, i i think that this person is really right on the money with these feelings and it, it feeling jarring to see everybody really i mean literally kyoshi's talking down to ang because she's like 12 feet tall but it's 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 weird to see i always saw the the past avatars as being supportive mm. whereas this it feels parental yeah and there, there's moments where it's like they have to like, he has to get there on his own. It's mm-hmm. a whole journey of it. And I think Kyoshi does do that a little bit. But it was it was just kind of like, she was terrifying to begin with. And it was like, oh, God. Like, sorry, Aang. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Uh, thank you, Elsie, for doing this. Uh, I can't wait to get to some of these other points. I know. Yeah. I'm so curious to see. You know, it, and that's the thing, is that I, I feel like we we went in a little harder than I think we thought we were going to. But I think we did it fairly. And I think overall, I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. And I, I don't want that to be lost. No, in this, agreed. Right? And yeah. so I'm, I'm actually really excited to watch the next four episodes. Like we're going to spend the rest of our day doing it. Today. We're going to do that right now. Right now. We're going <laughs> to like hit stop our car and we're going like, to run out. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I really do want to see it because at the base of it all, I do love these characters and I love this world. And I just can't wait to see the rest of it. Because I think that the people who are portraying these characters are wonderful. You can tell that the people love the source material mm-hmm. and they're doing with the time they have. And that's, that's one of the things that I'm thinking about in adaptations in general. 
especially with this, like condensing those episodes into the time they have. How do you tell that story and also like not piss off everybody? And, you know, there's a piece of me that is so happy that this exists and not that I don't want it to exist, but I'm excited for the next things that Avatar Studios is going to give us because that's going to be new. Right. Whereas we keep we're all so anchored in the animated series. It's like nothing like you said will compare to it. So new stuff will be like, oh, this is fantastic to see. Well, and that's the beauty of this, right? It's like you don't have to like it. You know what I mean? The original thing is always going to be there. So like it's not taking away from that. If anything, it's fun to see a different interpretation of it. And hopefully it gets more eyes Mm -hmm. on the original one, you know, so that's great. And we have more from Avatar Studios coming out. So it's like, give all of it to me. Yes. We love these things. There's, there's a reason why at the beginning of the intro, our current favorite pop culture obsession, like we're obsessed with these things. I'll take it in any form it gives me. Like if it's bad, I just won't watch it. <laughs> right. And, and, and the obsession is so real. It, it's, I mean, when we did Percy Jackson, Noah then read the rest of the series. I cannot wait to watch the rest of the animated series. I just ordered the four YA novels that are mm-hmm. based on the Avatar universe. So the obsession is real. Uh, so I'm excited to see the next four episodes here. Yeah. So if you have thoughts on our episode, on the episodes, or just whatever, want to say hi, abonipples at gmail.com. So send in those because we have one more episode to talk about for the live action. And we'll give a full, how do we really feel about this? And you, Also, let us know what you felt. Tell us your thoughts. Give us your nibbles. Yeah. Share your treats. Oh, man. (laughs) All right. So hopefully things are looking up. uh, Yeah. For the rest of it. We can't wait to get to mow more (laughs) of this. Bangarang. Till next week. Bye. (laughs)